So hello and welcome to the Africa Textile Talks. My name is Cyril Naika and I'm delighted to be facilitating this panel discussion this evening. Our topic is mining with nature. The fast fashion industry has become notorious for its constant extraction of natural resources and harmful practices that cause irreversible damages to natural systems. People are not separate from nature, so natural and social systems are always connected. So how do we bring back to into balance and cultivate fashion practices that exist in harmony with natural systems? In this conversation, you will hear from fashion practitioners who are championing nature-friendly approaches and sharing their lessons on how to design with nature instead of against it. Allow me to introduce you to our amazing panel this evening. I have to apologize, Dax is not with us this evening, who couldn't make it, but we, I'm gonna start with Musa Maxwell, who is a brand based in Johannesburg, founded by two unexpected partners, Maxwell Boko and Musa Kotsani. The pair met when they both were competing on David Lally's internship program. They competed against each other and both won a spot on the show um, at Fashion Week in 2016. Having similar interests and design aesthetics, they became best friends, fast friends, and created garments inspired by African heritage and contemporary culture with a particular emphasis on tailoring to complement modern women. In October 2017, the duo took a leap of faith and entered the South Africa Fashion Week talent search competition and won. Recently, they won the Karl Lagerfeld Award for innovation. Leandi Mulder is, Mulder is a designer and owner of the sustainable fashion label Leandi Mulder Designs. She's an experienced part-time lecturer with a demonstrated history of working in the education industry. She is skilled in fashion illustration, creative concept design, garment construction, and textile development. She has a Bachelor of Technology in Fashion from the Durban Institute of Technology and has a master's degree in fashion design and innovation from the Beijing Institute of Fashion Technology. And last but certainly not least is Dorcas Motumbo, who is a recent fashion graduate with a specialization in knitwear. She has a love for knitting, for the knitting medium, knitting industry, and especially natural yarns. For her graduate collection in 2021, she spent four months learning how to knit and knitted, very, and knitted her first collection called Baluma. Dorcas, I hope I've got that correct. She worked with Merino Wool for this collection. Recently, Dorcas launched her clothing brand, Amelia D, after, two, after a two-year pause from the 2020 due to the pandemic, and now has her garments available at the neighborhood market in Woodstock. So to the panel, we certainly understand that natural fibers are important, but we also have to remember that natural fibers uses water. The manufacturing of all fabrics required um, has toxic chemicals that have a negative impact on our planet the workers involved, and even us when we wear the clothes. Fibers need to be sustainably resourced. Otherwise, it's just adding a different environmental and ethical issue. And very importantly, we must remember the complex nature of our context. Polyester clothes are on average cheaper than clothes made from natural fibers. And we live in a country where many people don't earn very much money. We, we can't expect them to pay more for clothes and less on food. So over to the panel, I'm going to start with our first question. And the first question is for Liandi. Liandi, um, what, what, what does it mean for you to work with natural um, fiber, rather, sorry, work with nature um, rather than against it? Okay. Uh, yes, my mic is on. Thanks, Cyril, for handing it over for the first question. Thank you for having me today. Um, looking forward to this, some great conversations. Um, so your question about designing with nature is really close to my heart um, in every kind of aspect of design that I do personally. 
Um, I think starting off, um, it's really important to, for me, just to learn from the aesthetics in nature when I design. Um, I've always been very lucky to live in surroundings that have, um, that is really beautiful in nature. So being inspired by what is around me from the ocean to the rocks, to the mountains, to, to the flowers um, is something that I draw a lot of inspiration from personally, just on an aesthetic um, level, including textures and colors. Um, but over and above just looking at nature from an aesthetic point of view, I think it's really important to remember that everything that we do um, and in design specifically affects the planet. So our actions have, um, have consequences. So when I design, I think it's really important to construct and think in aligning what you do with how nature is working and the way that um, things affect the planet on an environmental level. So it's important to go back to the origins, in my opinion, not just starting design thinking from necessarily buying a textile and making something, but going all the way back to the actual origins of where your fibers come from. So I'm deeply invested in educating myself about um, the, the origins of the fiber specifically. So going all the way back to the farm, to farming practices, to the natural qualities of the fiber that you're using, to all the hands involved um, in, you know, generating and cultivating or, um, you know, growing the fibers. Um, and then taking that all the way through to the threads and to finally the textiles and your actual fashion garments. So I think um, it's important to carry these, um, these knowledges through when it comes to thinking about what is good for the planet. So what I do in my personal design um, is to focus a lot on textile development. So I look at first of all which fibers are good at um, are good and have the positive impact on the planet, and then I see how I can implement that in the final design um, to yeah just have that um, kind of very contemplative um, and positive effect on design and what you're designing and what you're putting into the world. Yandi, I love that because I think you've answered that so succinctly in the sense that you design obviously with nature as opposed to designing with the textile and then kind of figuring out where does this fit in. I think yeah. that's really beautiful. Um, thank you for that. And I mean, you've said quite a bit there, but I'm going to come back to that probably a bit later. I want to go to Musa. And Musa, I want to find out from you, you've chosen to focus on natural fibers in your design. Why did you go with this approach? I think we went with this approach because when we first started our brand, we were sort of using a lot of like synthetic fabrics. And as we went in, I think two or three seasons, when we started to collaborate with the Mohai cluster, that's when we got introduced to the Mohai fiber. So we sort of like saw the properties that the fiber itself has and the sort of like the environmental impact that it also has on the, like, comparing the environmental impact when between the mohair and the synthetics, we thought that it's, it's better sort of like use the, the mohair. So I think when you got introduced to the mohair, we sort of like saw the benefits of using um, natural fibers. And then, then we continued to sort of like investigate and work with more natural fibers because we also liked the way that it feels just in general, in terms of like the properties, the way that they is also, sorry, nope. <laughs> the way that they, they sort of like feel when you work with them as well. I think that's why we sort of like had that approach towards that natural fibers, yeah. I like that because I think it's it's similar to um, Leandi's approach as well. I think 
you know, sort of using natural fibers and allowing the fabric to inspire you and to yeah. kind of dictate the direction for your range. Thank you for that. That's really beautiful to hear. Um, Dorcas, um, you've become an unofficial ambassador for the wool industry. I love that. Um, why do you love wool so much? Well, I think it took me really by surprise to just fall in love with the industry completely. I think um, after I did my thesis and all the research I did on the wool industry, after asking so many questions, and visiting the entire and seeing the entire um, chain, how it's farmed, how the animals are taken care of, and the whole process, I just could not help it but love it, and and it became such a special thing for me that I think we need to teach people because when you're designing something that has been taken care of so well, that's been the process of just getting to the yarn itself before it's even just knitted is so special. And I think um, teaching it to people and using that story to tell people this is what was done to get to this final product that you're wearing, it's so special and people can take care of the garment. People can actually, cherish nature people can respect the work that farmers do the work that the sharers do and then in return also i guess appreciate us as designers that we also are part of this natural process and we get to create take the yarn and the wool that was just on the animal after it's all processed you take it and you create a beautiful piece of garment that they can also wear and love and care for. And even after they're done with the garment and they don't have anyone to pass down to, they can just, whenever they dispose it, it's biodegradable. Like, it's even amazing. It's just a brilliant thing and industry and wool is just great to use and work with. I love that because I think um, like the previous two panelists, uh, Leandi and Musso, you also speak a little bit about the value chain, sort of. So it's not just wool, but it's the entire value chain that that you you actually are, you care for, which I think is really important. Yeah. Um, Dorcas, obviously, you know the topic or the title is Africa Textiles uh, Talks, and I hear a little bit of an accent. Where are you from? Do you mind sharing with <laughs> the audience where you come from originally and a little bit of your background? Yeah. Well, I am originally from Congo, the DRC Congo in Bujumai. Um, my family and I moved to South Africa, Cape Town in um, 2012. That's almost 10 years ago now. And um, I pretty much did my high school here. And then I then studied fashion, just graduated in March. And um, I always say that fashion is the uh, a path that was given to me by God because of my name, Darkas from the Bible. She also used to sew. So I think fashion was embedded in me before I even knew about it. So, um, yeah, so I pretty much studied fashion. I loved, I loved the industry and I love what it has done. It has become right now especially with sustainability and um, the working with nature, producing amazing garments with nature. So yeah, that's pretty much, yes, where I come from originally and where I am today, yeah. Well, thank you for that. And it's great to have you in South Africa. So, you know, we look forward to seeing a lot more of your designs. I'm going to go over to yeah. Maxwell. Um, Maxwell, we know that you struggle to source the fibers and fabrics that you'd like to work with. What have been the biggest challenges and what has most surprised you? Oh, sorry, we just need to unmute. <laughs> sorry, I was muted there. Um, hi, everyone. So the most difficult part was finding varied fabric types locally because we don't have the the manufacturers that can produce a wide range of fabrics, um, even though we produce most of the raw material. 
but then what like Omayemi said you should look at it as in the previous talk you should look at it as a, a challenge not a problem to overcome so the thing that I don't want in this struggling with uh, lo with sourcing local textiles, the thing I don't want to do is to romanticize it and say, no, let's just source locally. Like, let's push the local narrative. It's very difficult because we have, we have as different designers, we have aspirations to use certain crepes to use um, certain wool poplins that are not produced locally. But at the same time, even though it's a challenge to work with the limited number of different types of fabrics that can be produced locally, it's worth it because it goes back to you making a change in your community. What's the point of just using luxurious fabrics from outside of the country and then what you make beautiful garments and is that good enough? It has to it has to mean something more than just beautiful garments. So that's why even though it's a struggle to source locally um, textiles, it's worth it. But at the same time, I don't want to romanticize it and make it as though it's a, a beautiful journey. No, it's a struggle, but it's worth it. I think it's important to, you know, the, the point where you spoke about not romanticizing and being upfront and honest about the challenges. I think that is important because we have to take into consideration the context of where we live geographically. But I love what you spoke about in terms of community. Um, I just want to follow up with the part two of that question. Um, do you use um, communities to assist in terms of some sort of practices in, in beading? or anything like that towards your ranges? Do you work with communities? So um, the previous collection was my favorite collection and no, not because we won the Kaleka Fell Prize, but because um, through the, the WOMAC, so the WOMAC, what they did is the most beautiful thing. They give their finalists a fund to create the collection. So this gave us um, room to, because Musa and I had always wanted to, to work with local artisans, but it's, it's expensive. And we are, that's the reason why we were using synthetic in the beginning was because we could not afford the proper materials because from the statement, when we drafted our statement of what we want the brand to be, we talked about sustainability and using natural fibers. But then back to your question in terms of like working with local artisans and communities. My favorite thing about the previous collection was the fact that with the fund, we got to fully go like fully go on with working with local artisans. We worked with hand filters, with hand woven. And my favorite was um, these ladies is like a, a community where they, they teach different, like they teach women um, how to, what to call this, how to crochet. They crocheted for us these circles that were quite prominent in the collection. And my favorite part was like, every time the, 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 the panel and the, and the press, they would go straight to the pieces that had those, um, those uh, crocheted uh, pieces. And every single time I would tell them, oh, these women, they made this and that and that. So, Going forward, that's another thing that's going to afford us having worn. It's going to afford us to be able to, uh, to afford to work with local artisans. I mean, you can work with them even if you don't have the funds, but it's difficult because these people, they have to make a living too. So they can do a kumbaya for the sake of it and help you with beading or crocheting. They have to make an income also. So it goes back to that thing I was saying that I don't want to romanticize the situation and say, oh, we work with this community, we work with hand felting, we work with hand woven. When you're starting out, it's difficult when you don't have the funds. So we're in a position now where we can even expand further, which is like very exciting. Thank you for that, Maxwell. I have to say that um, it, was, it wasn't a trick question, but I, I knew that you had worked with communities because I had followed what you had done for that innovation prize. But I think it was important to share that with the, with the audience that are listening, because you spoke about the challenges 
and I loved that you you kind of you know together with Musa you both identified okay how do we meet this challenge and how do we rise to the challenge and I think that's what we have to do so that is really beautiful so thank you for that um, Dorcas I want to go to you and I want to find out as a young designer what are your challenges to ensure your work is sustainable and ethical? Ah, this one has been a, a scary question for me for the longest time. I remember when I was in my second year, in my third year, and we were working on designing a collection. And I remember on that specific day, Jackie May came uh, on campus and we were talking about sustainability. And I was having such a hard time to understand why I was in the fashion industry, because it's like this industry that destroys and that because of all the polyester and these garments that are made. And yet you hear you're studying fashion and you want to add to that. How, how does that make sense? It was such a struggle. And I remember it, Jackie and some of my lecturers was like, that's why you're here, you're here to change it. And then, I was like, okay, that's convincing enough, but then how do you change it? Because it becomes so difficult when you go to a fabric store and you find fabrics, you don't know where they come from, what's in the fabric. And the person who's selling, who's supposed to be assisting you has no clue either. They're just there to sell. So mm -hmm. it becomes so difficult. And um, I remember last year I was trying to source fabric uh, to do my, I wanted to start my business again. And it was so hard to just go after you've done, like you've worked with Merino and you've worked with things that are good. And then you find yourself in a fabric store and you don't know what's in there. And I got stuck and I stopped again. And right now um, I started my business again. I first had to understand that for me to be at a certain, I have to be sustainable, of course, but to be at a level I want to be or to start, I need to start at the bottom. And the bottom, unfortunately, doesn't give us what we need to be sustainable. So I had to understand that if I wanna practice, I can practice some sustainability to my business, whereas I make sure whomever is, I know who's making my garments, I know that they treated well, I know that um, my garments are made well, that they can last a longer period of time. I know that at least I'm getting good quality products, even if the fabric is not natural, for example. But then right now I have had the biggest problem because I really am in love with the knitwear industry and wool. And I wanna make a hundred percent collection out of wool. And then I got to a point I was like, cool, I can buy some wool. And then I get to the where I need to get the wool, they tell you, but you can't buy one cone of yarn. You need to buy 12 cones. And then 12 cones cost you so much money and you don't have the money to do that. Then it becomes even more difficult to do anything because of the quantity that's required for you to buy and the costs. And as a young designer, as a recent graduate, I don't have so much money lying around to do that. So um, it becomes really difficult. And it's one thing that I'm excited um, to talk about with like everyone this weekend for the Wool Festival to just like find a way that will be able to help us as designers. Because I understand the process is a very difficult, expensive and good process. But then what's the point of it being where it is and then as a designer I can't afford it there is no real balance that can help me go forward and also me going around saying wool is good this is why you need to buy it but you don't have money to buy it so yeah that's one of our challenges yeah I think you know what's quite nice is um you know from from each of you I think you you know you're kind of also being quite open and honest you know just in terms of what the real challenges are as well, which I think is really great. Um, before I go to Leandi with a question, I just want to read some facts that were submitted by Twig. I think it is important because most people need to know this. Most synthetics are made from petroleum-based plastic. Um, as we are all aware, plastic is saturating our planet. 
over 8 million tons finds its way into our oceans every year. Um, and then just to go to a little bit of what um, um, Dorcas was talking about, cotton, mohair, hemp, wool, cashmere, linen, and silk are examples of fabrics which are not synthetic and are derived from either plants or animals. And then the good old polyester itself is cheap, it's resilient, too resilient and low maintenance. Um, it was first marketed to the American public by highlighting its anti-wrinkle properties. And since its parabolic property in, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, polyester has evolved into a versatile fabric. So there are quite a lot more stats which we'll go through later, but Leandi, I want to go over to you. And the question that we have for you is, um, can you tell us about the ancient practice of King Suji um, which, and how it has influenced your work um, and the idea of sulfurness along with sustainability is so interesting, but maybe before we get to that, maybe if you can explain what King Suji is uh, yeah. to our audience. <laughs> Um, it's such an interesting question because it's one of, when I first started in, in fashion, it was one of my philosophies of a collection or collections that I started doing when I was still studying at DUT. Um, I used to live in Japan um, about a decade ago after I, I studied. Um, I taught English there and it's always been a huge influence in my life since just learning about all the sentimentalities of the Japanese ways of thinking and design. So kin Kintsugi in particular um, is actually a, a form of craftsmanship where the Japanese use or they take um, really precious or old broken ceramics um, and instead of discarding the, the ceramic pieces they form a gold lacquer or like a, a gold glue and then they stick the pieces of broken ceramics back together so it gives the the old broken product a, a new life and there's new appreciation for it so that kind of um thinking influenced my design initially and uh, how we think about um, old and discarded materials that there's no place for anymore, um, especially, you know, throw, throw away garments um, that like denim or uh, sample pieces or, or in, I lived in Durban at that time. So we used to have a market full of um, old saris that were just kind of thrown away and not looked at and appreciated anymore. So I, I took... Um, I took the concept of using the old and recreating something new uh, where I, I, I use the old textiles through weaving and, and patchwork and even sometimes knitting to create um, new garments from it through all of these different hand, um, hand uh, craftsmanship techniques. So yeah, it just, it, it makes you, it's the same thing of working with nature, you know, not, um, not just using things that are new in the world, um, but, but taking what already exists um, and not adding to, you know, this, this landfall problem that we have um, and just finding creative alternatives to constructing textiles and making fashion. Uh, and how did that actually come about, you know, in terms of that inspiration? Because obviously that's a very, you know, soulful in terms of your mm -hmm. old broken vessels. Um, and what kind yeah. of inspired, because I'll tell you why I asked this is because I actually realized as you spoke about the saris, Camilla Gilman actually visited me once and brought your cushion cover um, and spoke about the, and it only dawned on me now that this is who it's from when you spoke mm -hmm. about it because I was I was fascinated with the with the repurposed sari threads yeah. um, but what kind of sparked that what was the you know sort of feeling okay this is something that we need to do and this is what needs to be in my business practice um I think it just it started when um you know I was a fashion student and, and looking at the the fashion climate in general and just walking through um like a an average retail store and just being completely overwhelmed by the amount of things that exist 
And I think um, it made me look inward and, and really think about where is my place in this whole scope of design? You know, how am I gonna, gonna be a fashion designer, but, but not, you know, be part of the problem, which, you know, as I think Dorcas said earlier, it's fashion is fashion is an oxymoron when you when you put it in the scope of sustainability. So um yeah, I just I try to find uh an avenue of of um just looking at what we have instead of adding to um to what is already there. Um, and yeah, that's basically where where the thinking did start. Thank you for Did that. that answer your question. <laughs> it does. It does. And I think it it really um, what's quite what's quite beautiful about that response is you put it back to the the role of the designer. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's the role of the designer, the responsibility of the designer. It's the responsibility of the environment, obviously, where you're based. Um, so that's really great, and I think it ties in again with designing with nature as opposed to against nature. Um, I want to go to each one and maybe I'll start with Muso. Muso, um, I want to find out going forward, what does our industry need to support designers to work ethically and sustainably? I think what the industry sort of needs is, first of all, be able to, I don't know, like, get producers so that they can be able to collaborate with designers in terms of like get um, locally sourced fibers or yarns, for example, and be able to produce them locally so that at least it, it sort of like gives an indication or a window to the, the way that the fabric is done and the sustainability aspect of it as well. How can they be able to sort of trace the fabric and they can be able to sort of also relay that sort of message to their consumers as well. Because I think if we keep on importing fabric all the time, it makes it expensive in a way. And we also don't know how that kind of sort of like fabric was sort of produced. So if we sort of like collaborate or work with local mills or, you know, manufacturers, it's easier for us to sort of like trace and sort of, um, be able to identify how the, 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 the yarn or the, the fabrics were produced and also being able to educate consumers on certain sort of like yarns. Cause some, you know, in South Africa, it, it's very difficult to sort of like convince people to say, oh, this is the wool coat and it's a synthetic melting. So if you sell something, for example, if I sell a melting coat to a consumer and be like, okay, next season I'm gonna do a wool coat. 100% wool code. They don't un they don't understand the difference between a synthetic and a and a, and a wool code. So also, I think being able to educate the consumer is very important so that they can be able to understand the sustainability aspect of it as well. Yeah. Thank you for that, Musa, and, and I love that response. Um, in fact, I'm going to use it a little bit to tweak the question again to to Maxwell. I'm just going to ask it in a little bit of a different tone. Because obviously we've been talking a lot about a lot to designers with all of you on the panel, um, and you know obviously Muso speaks about educating the consumer. So if I rephrase that question a little bit, and and Maxwell, if I ask you going forward, what can we do in our industry to educate the consumer to understand ethically sourced fashion and sustainable fashion? Um, from your perspective as Maxwell, what do you uh, you know Muso Maxwell? What do you think um, you would you would advise that we should do for the consumer? We've just got to unmute Maxwell. Please. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think I mentioned this before that I talked to someone like an international journalist, and I was saying Africans we inherently sustainable. We don't feel the need to go on top of the roof and scream that we are sustainable. And she said it's important to send the message. So I think as an industry narrative, all every time you get a chance to educate someone, say like mention it, talk about it, because not PR per se, but like narrative is everything to people. 
if, if you notice, for example, the big brands, they have, um, they have positioned themselves that our names are synonymous with high quality. So you pay this price and they believe that and they pay the price for that. So I think it's the narrative, push the narrative about the importance. Why is it important for you to choose the wool over the synthetic? every time you get a chance to talk about it. And what I've noticed is the retailers, the international retailers, they've actually, they have like certain pieces where they call them like an eco-friendly piece or something to, to sustainability. And when you click on that product, they tell you all the ways why it's important for you to get this particular sustainable piece. So talks like this, talk about it to the consumers because Unfortunately, there is companies that are doing a counterproductive to us, like a counteracting us, and they are promoting that we can give you fashion three new, three new drops in three weeks, three new styles. We'll give you three new styles in a week. So we are competing with people who are constantly driving their message to the consumer that will give you your, if you see your, your, your top now, you will get it in two days. Whereas Tina, we're doing hand woven pieces that you will get it three months down the line, but we have to convince them why is it important? Push the message constantly. That is great. I think you touch on a few things there. One is obviously fast fashion, which you know we started off the conversation by giving a little bit of a background to fast fashion which we certainly don't support. We support slow fashion. We understand fast fashion in terms of job creation, et cetera, but we certainly need to be held accountable in, in what we're doing when it comes to people and the planet. And I think the other thing that I really liked that you spoke about was in terms of timing and you know that it takes longer, slow fashion does take time. But I think more importantly, something you sort of briefed on was also slightly touched on was greenwashing. I think we need to be careful as well because there are a lot of brands that greenwash that tell a very good narrative, they tell a good story, but is that story actually true uh, versus young, talented young designers? And I think the narrative, to, to take it back to the positive, is um, you know, we don't need to look far. We can look at Tebe Mugugu, Cindy Sukmalo, Lukanya Mindingi, who just now in Paris this week raised the South African flag really high. And again, you know, here, looking at Leandy Mulder, looking at Dorcas, looking at Maxwell, you know, there's so much, there is so many things that we actually um, can tell. And the narratives from each of you is important because it educates ourselves as a consumer to understand, A, this is why I'm paying X amount for the garment. B, this is why the garment takes a bit longer. Um, and why natural fiber as opposed to synthetic fiber. I think those are really key and very, very important. Thank you for that, um, Maxwell. And then I want to go to um, Dorcas. Dorcas, what can we do to support you as a designer, as a young designer, specifically in encouraging you with your work ethically and sustainably? Jeez, <laughs> that's a, I have a whole list. <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, I think, it's first, the power of social media is very strong right now and everything's happening on social media. And um, I've noticed this, especially because um, when I did my first um, coat, the floral coat that went crazy, everybody just loved that coat with the 1060 flowers that I made on it. Um, Everybody knew me because of that code, but that was because I took part in the Twig um, Sustainable Award. And then Twig shared the story and then various stylists found me and used that code and various people in the industry knew me. And then when, because people know you and then you do your other collection and then people use it and share it around, people started knowing about my brand, people started um, following me more. And then the more I would put in the effort and share my stories on Instagram, especially Instagram stories, people watch them and um, people get to learn about what I'm doing and they get to see the process of the work. 
that you're doing. And then because of what other people are saying, it adds value to who you are. So I think um, talking about brands, sharing about what the local designers are doing, how they're doing it, speaking to them, going to their studios and seeing how they're working and telling stories and adding value and power to what they're doing. It influences people to choose the brand, the designer, and then they go and they um, get to build a personal relationship with the designer. Because I've experienced this uh, at the market where I am over the weekend. Some people come, they're like, yeah, we saw someone shared this and that's why we came. So that is very important. And then when it comes to um, designing in general, right now, my biggest problem is just, I want wool. <laughs> like I want wool to create my collection, my summer collection. I just need to get wool and it's difficult. I know that, but I need, we need to find a way to make it accessible for someone like me to be able to buy 12 kgs of wool. I mean, 12 kgs are really crazy, ridiculous. But um, for me to just be able to access wool, find a way to talk about it. I don't know how, because manufacturers would say uh, it's easier for them to dye 12 kgs than dye just one kg, but how will it help me? So I think that conversation, finding solutions to that will help me a lot. <laughs> like that's my biggest problem right now. I, I definitely can see why you are the unofficial ambassador of Will because I don't know if you realize, but every question Will has snuck in there somehow. You brought in Will. Somehow. <laughs> so I really see that you are the unofficial ambassador of Will. Thank you for that response, Dorcas. And I appreciate that because as a as a as just as a graduate designer, um, you know, to obviously answer a question in terms of how the industry can help. It's, there's a long list, you're correct. And thank you for being a bit succinct about that response. Leandi, I wanna to go to you um, in terms of the industry, what, what needs to be done to support you as a designer to work ethically and sustainably? Mm, um, yeah, I, I think I'm just gonna start off by, by saying, you know, we've, we, we all share the same struggles when it comes to sourcing, um, not only sourcing our materials, but also finding uh, people to work with. And um, when it comes to textiles, especially. And I think for us to, to be able to work more sustainably, we should be investing more, like I've said <laughs> previously, in, in textile construction. And when I first started, um, we I worked on a network collection um, in collaboration with Francis Van Hasselt um, and we hadn't ever done anything like that before this was a few years ago and we really really struggled um, to find manufacturers that could help us um, make this dream come, tr come true of creating a sustainable mohair collection of jerseys um, and I think even now, still looking back, it's really imperative for us all together to almost like create an open sharing platform where as designers, we can support each other in sharing the knowledge of who it is we work with. Um, where can I find a knitter? Where can I find a weaver? You know, who, who is open to doing small runs? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I stand strongly that this is something that that we need to to assist each other with as designers and especially as um, as young students coming um, out of university where it's like a big scary world and the only way that you can move forward is through connections. Um, it's very difficult to contact a company and say, hey, can I buy mohair from you? Because, you know, it's all about who you know. And I think if we if we can kind of eradicate that step and just build um, a, a tighter knit and more open community, that could be really helpful. I love that. Um, you know, what really came to mind, two things, two examples of that. One was... Um, probably about six or seven years ago um, at a fashion revolution introductory 
meeting in Cape Town at the Cape Town Fashion Council and the, the late Brian Ram Killowin actually said, we hunt better in a pack as opposed to alone. And then I think the same thing came back again at a rewoven conference a few years ago in Johannesburg, where we had the discussion with designers in the room and, and the conversation again was shared, uh, coming together as designers, sharing, uh, you know, trying to buy fabric together. And I think maybe, just maybe sometimes from a South African designer perspective, we compete with each other and we don't want to share knowledge and access to information. And I think you, what you've just said is actually beautiful. And, and, and oddly enough, I wrote down um, in a notebook a few days ago, the spirit of togetherness, not related to this conversation at all. And I think that's really what we've got to talk about. Ubuntu, we know, is an African terminology used really well, something that we need to aspire to. But I think that spirit of togetherness, similarly, you know, just taking it a different, in, in a different form. But thank you for that. Um, again, a big shout out to Twig for their, their feedback on, on stats, and I want to read some of these stats, so thank you for this information. Currently, synthetics make up about 60% of our clothes, and I'm saying this really for the, the people that have joined in on the audience, because I know that our designers would know this. Unfortunately, for, most, uh, important fashion, for the most important fashion icon, Earth, Demand for synthetic is growing faster than the demand for natural fibers like organic cotton, hemp fabric, cork, um, cork fabric, and ethical wool. By 2030, it's expected synthetics will, will make up 75% of the global apparel fiber production. That's a staggering statistic, 70% by 2030. Plastics, plastic isn't biodegradable. And even when blended with natural fibers, synthetic fibers take hundreds of years to break down, contributing to the 15.1 million tons of textile waste generated every year. You know, this is really, you know, it, it kind of takes a breath away and it gives you a little bit of pause to think, what are we actually doing? Um, and, you know, we've, we've listened from an incredible panel that have shared their knowledge and taken us into steps that they are using uh, before we go to questions from the audience, I just want to leave it open to Deandi, Dorcas, Maxwell, Musa. Is there anything that you feel that you, you want to add or say that we may have not covered or that was not asked in the questions that you feel is, is important to, to speak to our audience and let them know about? Um, and here, specifically to the title about designing with nature, um, you can be a little bit off topic, no problem, but I just want to try and bring it back to what we, we hear about. So does anybody have anything to, to share? No pressure, but just giving you an opportunity if there's something you feel that was um, that you need to add in. Dorcas, I see, is that your hand that went up? Um, we just need to unmute. <laughs> yes. So I actually just wanted to add what Nandi said um, about sharing. It's, I've always been very open to sharing with people what I know because what I know, I found that out from other people, they shared it with me. And different people have had very different experiences. And um, I've met one designer who said, I simply cannot share with people anymore because um, when you share, she shared with some people and especially one intern and they pretty much just copy and pasted her entire business. So it's scary for her to share and other people are afraid to share because maybe um, someone will copy what they're doing because after all, it's a, comp it's a competition, somehow it's a competition and everybody wants to be the best at what they're doing. And just earlier, we spoke about that same thing of sharing, coming together as designers and saying, okay, I just need three kgs of wool and another needs 10. Maybe then we put money together and we can buy a certain amount. But then the problem is again, when you do that, then everybody has the same stuff. Then it's also a problem. So um, it's, it's a very tricky thing to like get to share stuff. And um, also some manufacturers are scared to even share like where they're working because I've experienced it firsthand. <laughs> like the manufacturer opens an Instagram page and then they have to shut it down because 
they people that manufacture they are like no people can't know about what we're doing people can't know where we're getting so it gets very difficult for like young designers or even just experience like other designers to share their contacts and um be open about what they're doing even though it's actually necessary to it's a very tricky thing yeah you know i i hear you and and i agree um i agree with that and and i think that's why i think we we have things like non-disclosure agreements to put into place yeah. where if you're sharing with people you don't divulge but um you know, let me, you know, I'm fascinated, obviously, with uh, King Suji, that whole, the Japanese thing and, and Japanese food. I'm going to take it, maybe because I'm a little bit hungry at this time of the evening, but I'm going to go a little bit <laughs> to food. And I'm going to just say that, for instance, if you, sushi, for instance, you know, we all, you know, most people love sushi, but the ingredients are the same. You know, salmon, rice, soy, wasabi, um, you know, the, the sheet, you know, the nori roll to cover everything. But you go from one restaurant to another, you go to Japan, you go to China, you go to Cape Town, you go to anywhere in the world, those same ingredients are used differently. And there's always a differentiator between who makes the best sushi and people have different opinions. I know in Cape Town, there's a lot of talk between one restaurant versus a whole lot of other restaurants in terms of sushi. Similarly with clothing, you may have wool, everybody could have the same wool. And when you talk about trans-seasonal trends, et cetera, et cetera, everybody gets the same amount of fabric, same wool, same cotton, same lycra. But I guess designers use their creative ingenuity and how do they come up with something really creative? And I think it was Musso that spoke and Maxwell spoke about the narrative. Um, and I think if you look at um, designers that are telling the African story and telling our narrative and putting us on the map, they're also, they have the same fibers to use, natural fibers but they're yeah. using it differently. So maybe just something just to inspire, well, I hope it does, you know, that we all get the same part of ingredients, but how do we do it differently? Um, so yeah. it's not to look at people in competition, but to kind of figure out, okay, how do we take this to the next level? Um, yeah. Leandi, Maxwell, Musso, any, any comments from you? Uh, anything that you want to add that you feel you may have? I see Maxwell's hand, go for it, Maxwell. Um, I think the thing that is not often taught about is that the, the consumer to the people who are here also the consumer is also your responsibility it's not just the creatives who are supposed because often it's talked like what can the designers do what can the creatives do but the consumer themselves is also your responsibility to choose better because i can create all the wool i can in the world if you're still going to when you are able to afford the wool pieces, you still go for synthetic. Yeah. You are the problem. I cannot, yes. I cannot do it. The creative cannot do it all by Boy. themselves. Basically. Yeah. I love that because I felt that very personally. I felt like you were shouting at me and saying, you are the problem. I'm just joking. But I, but I take that as a consumer, a hundred percent. Leandi, Musa, I don't want to leave you out, but um, you know, we, I want to read a comment here. Thank you to all the panelists. Very good, interesting engagement. Um, have a good evening. So happy to have heard from the panel. I love Dorcas' enthusiasm around wool. I'm in wool production and would love to connect with the designers to see how we can work together in the future. Um, she gives her email address, he or she. I'm sorry, I'm not sure who that was. Uh, I think it's, it's she. Um, Leandia Musso, any comments from your side? Uh, I would also like to add that, uh, you know, companies such as Apple, Cotton Essay, uh, the, the Mohair, South Africa, they should sort of like, well, I think they are already sort of like reaching out to young designers, sort of like be able to promote and have a wider conversation about the yarn that's produced locally, right? And also looking at some of the designers that are doing so well internationally, it would be beneficial for these sort of companies to sort of like collaborate and partner with these designers so that they can be able to sort of like push the narrative even further, right? So I think for us, when organizations are willing to work with, especially young designers, to sort of create a different topic or a different sort of like narrative in terms of like, people are now more aware of what we can be able to produce as South Africans. 
and maybe then it also inspires the consumer to also think differently about what they put, what they sort of like consume, you know. Yes. So I think if you know manufacturers, uh, companies, if they can be able to sort of like collaborate or even make space for young designers to sort of have access to things like material, yarns, and stuff, things like that, it it will make such a difference to the designers themselves as well as be able to. Um, educate the consumer about the work that goes behind the product that they, they, they consume, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Musa. Leandi, anything on your side? Um, I think I just want to add, just sitting here thinking about how we have gone through such a like transitional time in the last three years and um, how the, the pandemic has really uh, made everyone just sit back and, and think more um, sincerely about uh, where they buy their clothes from and um, what kind of designs they want to make. And, and it is a, it's, I think it's a really interesting and exciting time to be working as a designer, especially if you focus on sustainability. Um, we are kind of like, you know, fashion is a zeitgeist of the times and there are now more conversations than ever that people are having about um, sustainable fashion and ethical fashion. So yeah, I think it, it, is, it is an exciting time, um, but definitely we need to push um, the consumer and designer conversation uh, more honestly, which will come with time, I think, as long as we are open and transparent with in everything that we do personally, I think um, it is slowly moving into a, a better direction. Absolutely. I think um, the pandemic for sure has been an equalizer on all industries, you know, in terms of doing better. And certainly transparency is, is paramount. Transparency across the value chain in the fashion industry. I wanna open up um, to the audience if there are any questions, we have a few minutes. Um, if you have any questions, if you can just signal by either raising your hand, um, you know, just letting the team know that you have a question um, and we we'll leave that open for a few minutes just for questions. But, um, you know, as we, as we wrap up, I think it's great because there's been um, uh, information also in the chat box, you know, um, Hello, I hope you can share, uh, hope you can share Instagram platforms here and follow other designers. Um, I think there's a, a, a real need for designer connection. We've been talking about that. Um, and I think this talk has really, and this conference has really given a great on day one. I think it's brilliant because we really need to be in unity as opposed to against uh, one another. Um, any questions from anybody while we uh, wait a few minutes? If there are no questions, I'm going to read probably another stat so that we have something interesting. Um, fast fashion goes hand in hand with synthetic, cheaper materials. Synthetic fibers are lightweight but strong. They add stretch and moisture uh, working properties, popular in technical clothing, activewear and underwear. Um, this perpetuates the pl plastic pro problem. So obviously plastics we, we identify is a huge issue. Um, so I'm going to wrap up because I, I don't think there's any questions from the panel. So I just really want to say to our panelists, to Muso Patsane, Maxwell Boko um, of Muso Maxwell, to Leandi Miller, um, Dax, we missed you. Um, it would have been great if you were here. Dorcas Matumbo, and I say it emphatically because Dorcas corrected me on how to say the surname, and I hope it's right, Dorcas. Um, oh, sorry, uh, before I say thank you there, there is a question that's come up. What are the molds that weave woolen textiles that designers can source from? I'll say that again. What are the molds that weave woolen textiles that designers can source from? Does anybody have any feedback that they wanna add to that? Um, woolen, I'm not sure about woolen textiles specifically, if anyone else has, um, 
a better understanding than you. But I do know that we have some amazing weaving mills like Mango, um, who do um, incredible work. And I know that they have collaborated with designers previously. So they've mostly specialized in cotton, but um, I think that could be an avenue worth exploring. And, um, and Cape, Cape Mohe, they also are a small weaving mill in Platenburg Bay. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Leandi. Um, that was from Neyasha. Any other response? Does anybody else have anything? But also, I would say um, to ne Neyasha, you can also reach out to Twig, post this just to get a bit of uh, information as well. But thank you for that question. Um, I really want to um, be polite in terms of the time guidelines that I was given, and we are drawing close to that. Um, and really, thank you to Twig, who has really put this incredible platform together and incredible um, talks and an amazing panel. And I hope that everybody would register. Please um, <coughs> contact um, uh, Twig's um, Instagram and, and social media platforms to register and to find out more information. I love that there is a response from Chandru. Hello, Chandru, good to have you in here. He says, contact TextFed for leads. Thank you for that. I uh, really appreciate that feedback. Um, Leandi, Maxwell, Musso, Dorcas, thank you so much. I think um, incredible gratitude for incredible gratitude for what you're doing in the local industry. We know that the industry is tough. I love it that Maxwell was very honest about not romanticizing the industry and being quite honest, but also like Leandi spoke about the pandemic, we certainly have opportunities to go forward and to look at where the opportunities. What I would suggest to people that are in the room that are listening, that are feeling demotivated um, and feeling that you've studied fashion, you're in this industry, but there is no opportunity. Also look at a hybrid model. You know, something quite interesting has been interesting st uh, stats during the lockdown was that during the lockdown, homeware was really, really popular. People realized they couldn't travel. They had disposable incomes. They couldn't go anywhere in the world. So they used their money to, because Zoom and Teams and all of these um, sort of digital platforms were open and we had to have meetings from our homes and people realized that they didn't have beautiful backgrounds or beautiful interior spaces. So they moved, they used the money to, to sort of give their homes a bit of a refurbish. And sometimes designers can move into the interior spaces. You could do beautiful cushions, you could do beautiful throws, you know, the sky's the limit. So if, you know, don't be demotivated, look for opportunity. Um, and to designers that are doing well, I really would encourage to lift as we rise, support the local designers, support students, take interns in, give them opportunity because it really begins with us. No, one's, no one else is gonna do it, it's really up to us. So thank you so much. I trust that you, would, you have, through this conversation, you've identified why it is important to support natural fibers, why it is important to support designers that are in the room, the panelists, that, would, that are speaking about designing with nature as opposed to against nature. I hope that you've learned something useful. Uh, please follow Twig on their social media platforms. Um, please get in contact with each of our designers on their social media handles. Um, and thank you, Leandi. Thank you, Maxwell. Thank you, Musa. Thank you, Dorcas. To everybody else, have a beautiful evening and please continue to stay tuned for Twig's um, Africa Talks. Bye, everybody.